Hi and welcome. I'm Sima Shapiro, the host of Activism in West Hartford. I'm glad you could join us today. I am joined by the same lovely ladies that I had last time. Please introduce yourself. I'm Sarai Hertz Velasquez. I'm Jillian Gilchrist. Beth Kerrigan. And Carolyn Gable Brett. And the we're old one. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> the old one. And we're here to discuss Brown. after the march today. So <laughs> At least 3.3 million people participated in over 554 marches across the U.S. Estimates show one out of every 100 Americans participated in a march. There were 500,000 to 1 million people marching in Washington, D.C., approximately the same number marching in New York City. Worldwide, approximately 5 million marched in 70 countries on all seven continents. The Women's March on Washington was at least three times bigger than the crowd at Trump's inauguration. So, welcome. Thank you for having us. Nice. Thank you. Give me one word to describe the march. Healing. Powerful. United and resistance. Let's start by your telling me your experience. Carolyn? Sure. Um, well, I went to New York City and I went with my partner, Leslie, and then also our daughter, Catherine, and our granddaughter, Jasmine, who's eight. And at first it was interesting because I think Catherine, well, especially Jasmine, was a little concerned. Was there going to be violence? Would it be um, scary for her? And we were obviously sensitive to her feelings. But I have to say, having done many, many marches in my life, that it was the most pe peaceful and uplifting march. It was really amazing. There were, they expected about 20,000 people, and it was close to half a million. So we, of course, we had tickets. We were a group. We called ourselves the, um, what do we call ourselves, the Fierce Feminist Resistance League. <laughs> so we sort of identified our own little group. Um, but anyway, we went and we actually ended up taking over the streets of New York City, which was a really wonderful feeling. Having marched down Fifth Avenue many times, um, where it's very, you know, controlled and sort of planned, and you have uh, actual permits, et cetera, for that area. So the women and the men who were there, it was a really fabulous uh, feeling, and I think we're all wearing our hats, except for Jillian, who had mine. one, but forgot, forgot to bring it, <laughs> didn't know we were going to do this. Um, but anyway, the hats, when I, and I was a little skeptical about the hats in the beginning, but when you got into the crowd, the crowds were amazing to see all these pink pussy hats everywhere and on all ages, and I loved especially the men with beards mm -hmm. wearing the pink hats, <laughs> that was really cool. So anyway, that was sort of my experience, and it was really um, a very empowering and uplifting experience. How Tell about you. the rest of you? For me, it really it started the day before, actually. Um, on morning drop-off, I, I walked my son to school, um, and there were women with the pink hats at school on Friday during drop-off, and um, moms were wishing other moms well um, and for those moms who couldn't go they were saying you know thank you so much for going and doing this and some of us after the bell rang walked back down the street together and it just was this sense that we're doing something big um, and once we got to DC I traveled by bus down uh, from West Hartford with uh, women you know getting on the bus I was recognizing folks that I knew from soccer with the kids or um, from groups in town. Um, and so to get to see people who you didn't know were going to be there, there was tremendous. Um, and then getting off the bus, um, you know, I, we had been told that DC was going to be around 200,000 people. And so I'd never been in a group that big. So I figured, OK, this must be what a group 200,000, you know, it seems like. Um, but to find out later in the day that we were amongst millions, uh, mm -hmm. you know, the phones weren't working, you couldn't get mm -hmm. internet, you couldn't mm -hmm. tell how big it was. Um, and so it wasn't until I was leaving um, from the march, which again was just this tremendously powerful experience. We marched down Pennsylvania Avenue um, and the risers were still set up from the inauguration and the risers were full of marchers. And everyone was cheering us on as we marched down Pennsylvania Avenue. Um, we marched past the Trump Hotel, um, which was a powerful experience um, to be among that many people. Um, and what we had talked about came true. I mean, it was 
quite the intersectional event. Uh, people were there because they cared about a variety of issues, but we stood together, um, united to stand for what we believed in. And so I was, I was saying, you know, it wasn't until I was walking back to the hotel, because um, I did stay over around five o'clock that my text messages started coming in, and I got, my first text message was from my dad, and he had said, we've been watching all day, we're so proud of you, mm -hmm. don't worry about Edith, who's my daughter, um, you know, we're just so proud of you. And I was like, watching all day, you know? And to find out that it was in the millions and that it had been across the globe, that we had mm -hmm. done what we mm -hmm. were hoping for was just the most amazing experience. Yeah. Beth? Um, it's funny, you know, talking about these texts that you get. Um, like I got a text, one of my neighbors said, be safe. You know, a lot of people just wanting you to be safe going down there. And mm -hmm. I hadn't even thought, like, this might be a, mm -hmm. a dangerous situation at all. Um, so we left on Friday right after uh, the boys had a midterm um, at Hall High. Um, so uh, my boys are 15, they're, they're freshmen, uh, my wife Jody and uh, Dana Cool, who's a friend, uh, we drove down there Friday. And then we uh, took a bus, for, we stayed in Baltimore, took a bus. Uh, so we got to go to you know, the train station and get on a bus and, and go into the city. Did you see like-minded people in the train station? Oh my goodness! The train Did you station, see them in the like everywhere you went? Could you see that there was this movement moving towards? It was crazy in Baltimore because they was wrapped around mm -hmm. the building, and yeah. we're like, oh my goodness! These buses that are lined up, they were all trying to get on the trains. Mm -hmm. And later we found out that there were not enough trains to get all these people into D.C. So they ended up marching around the Baltimore train station. Um, I can't believe we even wow. found the, the the bus. Uh, so we got onto the bus, and it was so cool because there was. Um, Three generation there from California, Santa Rosa, California, a grandmother, mother, granddaughter, all there. They flew in for this, um, and it was overwhelming. You know the the amount of people, and the I just felt everyone was there for humanity. You know for you know the women that we uh, went with, our friends uh, that lived in Baltimore. We had marched with them in the late '80s and, and the '90s, and it was all about um, you know gay rights, gay lesbian marches. So um, this was so different. Than, than those marches because it was so broad in its appeal, whether it's environmental, social justice, or, or labor, it wasn't just a gay issue. Um, but what united us all, for so many, and Jillian too, with pink hats. <laughs> I am now running around town in my <coughs> pink hat. It's my new running hat. Mm -hmm. that, that's very cool. <laughs> <laughs> so a lot of times when you're in a city, you don't see other people. And as a matter of fact, you try hard not to look them in the eye, right? Isn't that the old adage, when you want to get on a subway, you look down? So I'm wondering if it, your experience was that everyone was looking at everyone and everyone could see around them. Was there that sense of Well, I rode the subway in from Brooklyn into the city, into Manhattan. And, um, you know, I, I don't go by that adage. So we do interact with people on the subways, but some people don't. And, um, but I try to sort of maintain the same kind of natural style of interaction regardless of the situation. But there was definitely a different energy going in on, uh, for the march. Or even in the restrooms. <coughs> you know, when you stopped in the mm -hmm. restroom and everyone's mm -hmm. walking around with these pink hats and the, and yes. the line to get into the women's mm -hmm. room was so long, so we actually ended up taking over the men's room and mm -hmm. someone had gotten a piece of paper and put a W and an O next to the men, so it said women, <laughs> into the Baltimore rest stop. It was so fabulous, you know. Mm -hmm. That's great. Sarai? Um, so I went to the march with my mom. Um, we also went on a bus. So that experience in and of itself was amazing. We all, so my mom and I went um, with a couple other people to the Trinity bus station, or not really bus station, but it became a bus station. <laughs> um, and there were buses everywhere, and I saw, I ran into all these people who, like, I never would have thought would go to the Women's March, but it brought together all these people um, who clearly really cared, but um, never spoke out or felt like um, their voice could be heard. I don't know, but like Beth was saying, it was a very intersectional um, event. Um, and so my mom and I went and then we met my grandma and my aunt and my cousin um, and my grandma has been marching for many many years. So is um, this your dad's mom? This is my mom's mom. Your mom's mom. So she had like a sign that said um, I'm tired of or I can't believe I'm still <laughs> protesting this. <laughs> um, you know the one. Yeah. 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 Um, so, so it was amazing. To, it was like an intergenerational um, experience with my mom, my grandma and then 
um, my aunt and my cousins. It was awesome. Um, and then I also liked how a lot of marches that I am at or protests or rallies, I'm always with like a very specific group of people. So I was at a Planned Parenthood march or rally the other day, and it was mostly women, predominantly women of like white women, a couple women of color, but it was like mostly women, and they were all um, there for one run reason only. Even though that was it was solely for Planned Parenthood, but um, for the women's march, it was like for these all-encompassing um, issues that people from all over the world cared about, um, and it was like men and women and people who identify as um, gender non-binary, um, gender non-conforming. It was people from really all over the face of the earth, and I thought it was so cool to be a part of that. So, so it's clear what was positive, but were there any lows? Was there any negative at all? Not in New York. <laughs> it's the first march I've ever been in where there weren't protesters, mm -hmm. and so it was all totally positive. It was all great energy. I never anywhere you know, where we marched, and we, we just went into the streets because we couldn't move. But um, there were no protesters. I did read afterwards that there were protesters in different places, a few, and that they were circled by people, mm -hmm. and just with, you know, sort of positive energy to sort of camouflage them or, you know, hide their, their voices. So, it, um, but in New York, I never saw anything negative, which was fabulous. Yeah. Were there any speakers that any of you heard who you felt didn't represent what you were there for? Anybody who sounded out of line? Um, I, all, most of the speakers that I heard, um, Gloria Steinem um, was my favorite. Um, mm -hmm. um, I also really liked, uh, Alicia Keys was nice as well. Um, Madonna's was, I felt like, more targeting towards the government um, instead of what they represent and wanting to um, just like negativity and violence towards them which I thought was the opposite of what the march was about um, and we also we also had some um, like pro-lifers that were there but their voice was like so small compared to ours so I didn't feel at all like unsafe or threatened Tell yeah. us about your experience, too. Yeah. I went to Hartford. I had a mm -hmm. ticket to go to Washington, but um, the coverage that I was intending to do, there were some live feed uh, people right there, so I decided to stay here. Um, so my one word is empowering. Mm -hmm. um, and I just was struck on so many different levels about the gentleness mm -hmm. of the crowd. Mm -hmm. um, and as silly as what I'm about to say, there were some absolutely gorgeously artistic signs. Mm -hmm. And it made me think about the creativity that especially women bring to the table. Mm -hmm. Because it was an overflowing of emotion for which creativity is one facet of all that. And it just made me think that so many people who had gone were in effect pouring their heart out. Whether or not you could see it or whether or not they said it or whether or not they stood for it, their very being for being there, their very reason for being there um, was, was acknowledged and was affirmed, mm -hmm. if you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. Well, I thought it was fabulous. I heard there were about 10,000 people there in were. Hartford, yeah. And, yeah. which is a really uh, big crowd for Hartford Huge. if you've yeah. been to other yeah. yeah. demonstrations and rallies there. Yeah. So, I mean, it's just like across the country and across the world. I think that the anticipation of what the turnout would be was always minimized compared to what the actual turnout was. And that just, I think, shows the amount of resistance that there is in this country against Trump and his... Mm -hmm. And the amount of peaceful resistance, <coughs> the fact that it was that mm -hmm. large across mm -hmm. the globe and mm -hmm. there was no violence right. mm -hmm. was huge That is to amazing. Me. Right. The day before, I mean, I got nervous because on the news there were protests, there very were. violent protests in mm -hmm. D.C. on Inauguration Day. Um, but there were only 200 people. Yeah. Right. I mean, yeah. It was, when you put that in perspective, yes. it's so small and I think that that got blown out of proportion, yep. which is why we too were nervous yep. about our eight-year-old granddaughter and why she was a little scared mm -hmm. but then it, you know what happened in the actual experience was very different yeah. and how powerful that is because that was so many people overcoming that fear to mm -hmm. come out right mm -hmm. that's that's and they came out yeah mm -hmm.
a lot of those people Literally. suffer from claustrophobia <laughs> and right. things like that. So I think that again is a testament to them speaking without actually using their voice mm -hmm. and using their words. So because this piece is called After the March, I'm wondering, do you feel like you accomplished what you set out to do or the march accomplished what it set out to do? Beth? Absolutely. I mean, the momentum that we have now behind us when we saw the support throughout the entire world that everyone is concerned about our future, um, environmental future, or economic future, or, or social justice future, it doesn't matter. I mean, the world is behind us. and so. There are small groups that have cropped up from the march, whether it's the West Hartford group or the bus captain group mm -hmm. or you know, the Pantsuit Nation uh, CT, which is PSN CT. Um, uh, there's so many of them, you know, Action CT and Forward CT. Um, there is um, a momentum now that will not stop, and it's for action. Everyone knows it's not just about marching, it's about making the phone calls and writing the letters and getting involved in politics. You know, there's a big push to get individuals in politics that reflect the values that, that we uh, reflect. Um, how to lobby, um, how to raise money. Um, this is just the beginning. Mm -hmm. Carolyn? Yes, no, I agree with you 100% because I do feel that um, there were some criticisms and I found that most of the critical pieces that I read were sort of the white male conservatives saying, oh, this is not gonna really change anything. But I think that the energy that we all experienced and saw, um, it's part of what you have to do. You do have to stand up and resist. That's just one piece of the strategy. Then you have to take action, which I think people are doing. And I you know, get a tremendous number of different well, choices or options or recommendations for action. And I think we all, in our own ways, are doing those different things. So collectively, that's what I was talking about, I think, before the march, too. It's so important, as you said, mm -hmm. the intersectionality of what has come together around the Women's March. And I think that will move us forward. And I think we're just going to have to do a lot of uh, rise up and resist. Mm -hmm. That's what we talked about. So before we move on, I'm wondering, for the viewer, where can they go to get more information? Let's say there are people out there who don't know what direction they should go in or want to go in. Mm -hmm. Do you have some organizations or some websites you would like to recommend to them? Well, also, if they just go to that basic Women's March one, mm -hmm. um, that has a lot of uh, continuing recommendations, and there are a lot of different actions and programs, and there's a project, uh, one, or, um, 10, 10 days, 10, days. 10, mm -hmm. uh, 10 postcards in 100 days. So that's one small action that people can take. But also, all these rallies around, I mean, some of the horrific things that have happened in the last 10 days since uh, Trump's inauguration have been mobilizing for many people who I think in the past haven't stood up and, and spoken out. And so I think that will continue. Yeah. Okay. But I think if you go to the Women's March um, on Washington, it's uh, or you know, March on just, Connecticut or, or the Connecticut, but I think right. the national one helps to give people mm -hmm. all the different options and choices. Mm -hmm. And the amount of people who have called their elective, elected officials, mm -hmm. like although it's such a small thing, may take like a minute out of your day. Um, I've been trying to do it just a couple each day, and although obviously I can't see the direct impact, um, I have a feeling that it's doing a lot. Like you'll have to wait a while to even get someone on the phone, and I know that's because a lot of other people are calling. Um, so I think that even just call, make one call a day, I think it could do a lot. And they've already seen that because Chris Murphy said there was over 11,000 right. Right, right. pieces of communication either by way of a, a, a postcard, a letter, an email, or a phone call saying that they didn't want Betsy DeVoe to be um, mm -hmm. in charge of our right. public education. Mm -hmm. I think it will force all the elected officials to have to listen in a way they mm -hmm. haven't been forced to to do in a long, long time. Mm -hmm. You know, would you agree? Absolutely. Yeah. So um, let's talk about your call to action. Carolyn, what are you going to do moving forward? Well, you know, I think standing up and resisting and being visible is one. Like the, the rally we all just, I think everybody was mm -hmm. at, just yeah. came from right here in our own <laughs> town of West Hartford um, and trying to make West Hartford uh, a sanctuary town that there's a petition going around about that so that's important to know that people can go right online to the um, West Hartford town 
and sign up and be part of that action. But then, you know, you can do the sending postcards, you can call. I also would recommend that um, people call the Connecticut numbers because you can't always get through if you want to do your own, um, you know, local Congress people and senators. So you can use the Connecticut numbers. So that's what I've been doing. Mm -hmm. Beth? Well, one of the things we're going to be doing is what they call a, a huddle, where they're going to take between 12 to 15 small groups to get um, individuals throughout the state of Connecticut to get together to sort of strategize. Um, because just marching is not going to do us any good unless we turn it into action. So tell me more about that. Well, it's going to be sort of like a kickoff, like after the, after the march, where 12 to 15 women are going to, well, it doesn't have to be women, I guess, does it? I don't think so. <laughs> um, come together and talk about specifically what your goals might be and then strategize what's the best way to do that, whether it's fundraising or getting the word out, educating people, um, doing the lobbying. Um, you know, we have to get in power, and if we're not in power, then we have to be able to influence those individuals that do have the power. So where will you find these women? Are these women who went to the you, march? Are they from differing a, groups? Anywhere. Anywhere. A friend tells a friend tells a friend tells I a see. friend, yep. and that work is just going to go out like tentacles. Sure. So if you're interested, you know, anyone that's sure. interested, go on um, March on Connecticut, or you can reach any of us. Um, sure. Absolutely. What do you think? One of my next action steps, yeah. um, we are organizing forums across the state in, I know we don't have counties officially, but by county, um, <laughs> to bring various nonprofits and organizations together so that the public can come and kind of, to your point earlier, see what activism is available to them. How best can they, you know, use this energy they have for good. Um, so that's one area. Um, I'm going to continue to post my thoughts and articles on Facebook because I think having dialogue there is important. That's a way I am active. Um, and then I'm seriously considering running for office is another oh, action. Oh, great. Set. Wow. There we go. Um, so at my last and my first like the last one I went to, but the first one I went to, if that makes sense. Um, Generation Action um, Internship at Planned Parenthood, we did uh, a whole day on organizing and how to organize. Um, so I learned a lot about like how, how much it takes, <clears throat> how much energy and effort it takes to mobilize a community and what sort of steps you need to take to do that. Um, and also just like basic things about how does a bill become a law and how does do ideas move through through the government and just like foundations and fundamental um, uh, like ideas about that that I think would at least for me help me um, take action like in just even small action in my community um, and also like in school I have been doing little I've been trying to do little things um, I don't know who someone just started like a put like a sticky note thing where you put sticky notes around the school that say nice things. And even mm. though it's like in our school um, and we have 1,600 people, it's like in a small town, I think that just, again, starting that dialogue um, and reaching out to people that maybe you haven't talked to or just being nice to other people, just everybody, um, that's the, the first way I want to start taking action um, in my community. So I have two thoughts, one of which is, has there been a day since Trump came into power where there hasn't been a rally? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think so. Because no. I'm, think, I'm thinking while or I'm sitting here. Or even before. Or even before. I mean, I think it's been mm. a nightly yeah. thing on the news. Well, yeah. and it's been yeah. a nightmare. Yeah. It's, yeah. been, it's, yeah, been, it's a been a nightmare, nightmare. Yeah. right? Yeah. You really have to start picking and choosing because you can really exhaust you yourself. Yeah. You yourself so consumed yes. mm -hmm. in you absolutely do. yourself, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So that was my next question. Thank you. Sorry. Um, <laughs> what is it that you're going to do to sort of make certain that you don't burn out? Because I don't think it's difficult for so many people across the country to literally turn on their TV and up goes their endocrine system. And truthfully, you can't take that on a daily level. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm wondering, um, what will you do to shield yourself and therefore also make progress? Do you have thoughts? I'm fortunate, because I have a seven-year-old and a four-year-old at home. <laughs> and so, although it's still hard, and my husband's been saying, put down the phone. Like I, you know, I look at my phone, I have 27 notifications, 54 notifications on Facebook, because so all these different groups and actions. And it's like, I have to put it down. Um, because I do get stressed out as soon as I see something he's done. Um, and so I can focus on my children, and they have no idea what's going on. Um, and they're happy, and so I can just engage with them, and that's my release. 
Carolyn? Well, I was going to say, you have to see sort of a long view. Uh, I think personally, if you are a social activist, that's a lifelong commitment. And it doesn't change. I mean, obviously right now, and with um, Trump and the, the horrible situation that's happened in the last 10 days, we all are more sort of uh, standing up and speaking out and, and taking action. But I think the long haul is that this is part of your life's commitment. So it doesn't change. I think, you know, I wonder what you think about these times. Because you have the benefit of 30, 40 years of activism. <laughs> no, 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 of, of solid activism where mm -hmm. you know this too shall pass or that there's another mm -hmm. phase and that mm -hmm. things will find their equilibrium and then they will dip again. But here you are and you're really coming into this in, in a very, uh, a, a whirlwind situation. Do you feel that? Yeah, and I feel really scared a lot of the time, um, just about what's going on. And I also don't know, like, if I what I can do all the time. Like, I feel like because I'm such a young person, um, I feel like a lot of times there's nothing I can do. But then I'm like, oh, but I can because young people have so much power. So it's like this dialogue I go back and forth with. And I also feel very responsible as um, a white um, female identifying. Uh, educated um, person who lives in the US I feel like it's my responsibility to um, help others and educate others and also like change the reality that we're living in so um, yeah I don't there's not I I look to people like my lovely three other panelists um, <laughs> for mentors like for advice on how I can um, move forward without like exhausting myself because right now I'm so consumed in this. Mm -hmm. I love being consumed in this because this is my favorite thing to do. Um, but it's exhausting, especially when you're in the community every single day that a lot of people don't agree with you and you're sort of the only one who um, is always focused on it. Like for me, this is like my priority over everything. And um, I know that I share that view with very few people. Um, at my age, so mm -hmm. yeah. Beth, how do you shield yourself? How do you really get yourself? Not very well. I have yeah. not, mm -hmm. not, I gotta say, this is really not a good thing for someone that tends to be a little obsessive about stuff. So um, I'm hoping <laughs> that I'll get better with this. Um, but I, you know, when you went to the march and you see uh, Gloria Steinem or Angela Davis, and I'm like, oh my goodness, mm -hmm. these women have been doing it for. I know you've been doing it for a long, but 50, 60 <laughs> years, That's right. and they yep. still have the yeah. same vigor. They still have the same intensity. This is a, a march for humanity, and and this is a great time, you know, for someone like you as well, because there was this complacency that was happening where everyone mm -hmm. was kind of, yeah, mm -hmm. we have this, we have that, and no one really cared about others as much as they do now. And I think we all feel like, oh my goodness, we're a little at risk mm -hmm. um, if, if we don't we're very all. Much if, at well, risk. not yes. I mean, right. if we all right. don't do something, because before you could rely on a few. But now everybody has to really play, pay their, play their, pay their part, and I really think they are. Mm -hmm. I'm optimistic. So I'm getting back to the finding their voice because I think that this has helped so many people find their voice and find their passion and find the direction that they want to go in, to make a difference in whatever way that it means to them. Would you agree? Yeah. Definitely. I mean that's an amazing thing. The other thing I'm wondering is, we are a very diverse country. And we have lived differently regionally. Um, and I'm just wondering for your very final thoughts, this has sort of forced us to sort of look at each other as if we really are one. Um, we may live in different areas. We may have differing value systems. We may have been raised in differing socioeconomic uh, conditions. But we are really looking at each other in the eye and saying, you know, we all belong to this movement, and we all can help. Quick thought? Yeah, well, it's, for me, it kind of reminds me of when there's a disaster about to happen, you know, a hurricane has just happened or 9-11 happens. Everyone comes together in a way that is so unlike our day-to-day. -day. And I, I think that this is doing the same thing, where individuals are not seeing anything other than the fact that we are humans together. But I think we can't minimize the fact that this country is very split mm -hmm. and that those you of us here... <laughs> No, but I'm not. <laughs> but it's true that no. we, that our country, that's why we have Trump. And we have these horrible policies that are, in fact, seem as draconian as I think I've seen in my lifetime. Yeah. So I don't want to minimize that. And I think it's important to say 
uh, you know, how do we find the truth? Mm -hmm. Because that's what's happened. So there are so many lies and there are so many things that are true that have been dismissed. So I think finding the truth, finding people that support you, uh, working together, those are the ways we all will get through But the this. majority was on our side. <laughs> we, so yes. Keep that in mind. Yes. I am sorry, we have run out of time. <laughs> <laughs> we are going to meet again, are we not? We will meet yeah, again we'll, in yes. about four months. We will discuss the state of Trump. Um, we also hope to have another series um, on people who have chosen another life, another venue of activism in West Hartford. So for now, I want to thank you so much for joining us. This is the second of three parts of activism in West Hartford. I'm Sima Shapiro. I've been your host and producer. And until next time, I hope you take care. We're walking for women. We're walking for girls. Walking for peace all over the world. We're walking for justice. We're walking for truth.